Okay, good morning everyone. I'm here to talk about Git tip. Um, we, uh, we have a problem, or at least as a community, I think we have a problem. Um, open source as a model is great as an intellectual exercise and all of the documentation that's been written by uh, Richard, St uh, Richard Stallman or by um, uh, Eric Raymond is really, really good at hitting the, the philosophical arguments for why open source is really, really good. But at the end of the day, the freedom is, is really is, is, is good from an engineering point of view, but it still costs money to develop software. Someone has to spend time, time is someone's time they're taking away from a paid job or whatever to actually develop this software. So how do we develop, how do we actually pay for the development of open source software? Well, one option is a sugar daddy. Go find some large company that's willing to pay the bill for you to work on open source software out at your, on, your own, on your own time. That, that can work, however, there's, a, there's a, an inherent conflict there. I don't know how many of you have been in a situation where the boss says, hey, no, we'll give you a day a week to work on your project, your pet project, and then the deadline comes, and no, that, that time disappears very, very quickly. Option two is to abstract it out a little bit further and go, okay, well, rather than have this employee, we're going to spend 20% time working on open source, we're going to go for corporate sponsorship. We're going to say, okay, we're going to donate a large sum of money or a sum of money to make sure that this, this project continues. Problem is corporate sponsorship, I don't know how many of you have ever been involved in fundraising. Getting companies to part with money is hard at the best of times, and when it's altruistic, it's even harder still. The, the model that's always pitched when you look at Eric Raymond's type documents uh, is, well, you go into consulting. You are the person who developed this open source project. You just open a consulting company and people will come to you and solve your problems. And that can work. You can make very viable companies supporting open source. But, again, the, the dollar leads and if you've got a customer who desperately needs you to do problem X, you don't necessarily have the time to then go and spend developing the product if it isn't directly tied to a customer's needs. Just recently, in the last couple of years, we've seen the emergence of crowdsourcing as it provides possibly another way of looking at this problem. And that's where GitTip comes in. Now, GitTip is not my project. I have no formal affiliation with it. It's been entirely run by a guy called Chad Whitaker. Um, I have his blessing to do this talk, so this is just me. He couldn't make it here to this conference, so I'm just letting everyone else here know that GitTip exists. What is GitTip? It asks you the question, can you spare a dime? Or more accurately, can you spare a dollar? Could you spare a dollar a week to support the people in your community who you know are writing open source software? People like Jesse Nola, who aren't writing software or are helping the community. Could you spare a buck to make his life a lot easier and so he could actually spend more time concentrating on the project or concentrating on the ways that he's contributing to the community rather than having to be actively looking for a, for a, for a job? So what you do, you go find someone who has a GitHub account. Okay, everyone in this community who is working with open source at this point, even if they're not putting their code on GitHub, probably has a GitHub account so they can contribute to someone else, and that's the identifier that we use. You find that person and you pledge to give them a dollar a week. You go and you, you provide your credit card details, you say, I want to give Graham Dumbleton a dollar a week because I love Mod Whiskey that much and it's making my life so much easier. I like uh, what Armin Ronica is doing with, um, um, with, with Ginger. I want to make sure he's got a buck a week, I, I'm going to give him a buck a week. A dollar a week shakes out to $52 a year. It's almost nothing on a week-to-week on a -week basis, but 50 bucks a year, that's, you know, that's some comfortable beer money, but still well and truly inside a rounding error for most people's budgets if you're, you know, if you're a well-paid software, software person. If you've got 2,000 people who do that, you've just paid for someone's full-time salary. There are 400 people at this conference. If everyone in this room was to give $1 to, to, to the same person, you've basically paid for one day a week out of someone's, someone's day. So if I, I, if I was a consultant, you gave, everyone in this room gave me $1, I could spend a day a week working on Django. And that's what GitTip is. What I'm here to say is that GitTip exists. It is a way of, uh, it's very, very early days and it's still, not, it's really only paying for beer money. It's not paying for full, full open development money. But the, I think the potential is there. Everyone in this room has benefited from open source. I think as a community, we all need to start giving back. We need to find the people who are contributing to open source, the people who are making our lives collectively better and start giving back to them in a real financial way. We can get companies, and companies may be able to help, to help with this, but I think as a, as a community, we need to start stepping up and say, we want our lives to be better. We don't want to have to use Visual Studio for a living. We want to have good tools for a living. And I'm willing to pay a buck to make that happen. I don't know about you, but I think it's a really good idea and I'd like to encourage everyone to go jump on board and start supporting the people who are making our lives better. Thanks. All right, so next up we have uh, Yuri Yasu and Nick Galbert about Captricity. And then after that is uh, Brian Maloney. Uh, 
Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Yori Yasu Yanu. Uh, Yor you can just call me Yori. Uh, I'm from a startup based in Berkeley, California called Captricity. So in a nutshell, what we do is that uh, we take uh, paper forms and we turn them into uh, digital data. So essentially, a user of our website will uh, submit to us uh, images of paper forms and we give them back a data database or a spreadsheet containing the data that were in those paper forms. So uh, I'm actually not gonna talk too much about Captri our product, but rather uh, the technical challenges we faced with it. So uh, as we actually do a lot of image processing. Our product, the nature of our product um, requires that we uh, do those processing in a background. And so because of that, uh, these go outside of the traditional request response framework of uh, a traditional web app. So uh, we rely on Celery to handle and manage all those uh, asynchronous processes. And so uh, when we were first building the pre-release version of our product, uh, we were kind of naive and dumb, and we kind of just took Celery out of the box, and we were like, well, why don't we just shove all our asynchronous processes there, and it will probably work. So we just uh, made our product so that we just put all our asynchronous processes and all the processes image processing that needs to be done one at a time once on Celery, and then we popped all our champagne and just went home and celebrated for the day and ran our test set through our service. Well, what happened was that when we woke up the next morning, uh, things didn't go as planned. We, had, we were faced with a whole slew of problems ranging from uh, lost data, uh, corrupt data, and duplicate data. So we realized that we need to be a little bit more smart about the way we used uh, the celery and uh, how we were going to handle the things. So we basically boiled down the problem to uh, two things that we wanted to solve. We wanted it to be fault tolerant and we wanted it to be a uh, concurrency safe. So this is just a, uh, this is an implementation or a solution that we came up with to deal with that. So first for uh, fault tolerance, uh, we decided to use the database to keep track of uh, processing state so that uh, we could pick up anywhere that we leave off. So if any machines that were working on any uh, celery work gets killed or gets lost, uh, we can basically always look back to the database to pick up uh, where we left off and we know where, what processing still needs to be done. So uh, linked with that, uh, we also implemented a periodic task that will uh, run in the back, that will run to uh, re-enqueue any work that is necessary. This is to ensure that uh, that work will eventually get done and that work will uh, eventually be requeued even if workers get lost. So uh, these two together uh, deal with that problem of recoverability and reliability that is inherent in a fault, being fault tolerant. Uh, finally, for concurrency, we just resorted, resorted to uh, the traditional method of using locks. Thanks, Django team, for uh, having Sleffer update in 1.4. Uh, uh, that has helped us a lot. And so also as a fail safe, we decided to also use uniqueness constraints in the database. So the philosophy there is that we wanted uh, workers to throw exceptions and get lost and get killed instead of uh, having corrupt data in the database that is harder to recover from. So these two together, we have made a better, more robust system using Celery and to handle our asynchronous processes. Unfortunately, this is not perfect. We still have uh, deadlocks and uh, we those cause us to have the workers get lost and we have to wait for the periodic task to re enqueue them. And so our processing can get slow sometimes. So we have some higher level of concurrency issues still to solve. So uh, we're, uh, we're more than happy to listen to, to talk with anyone who had uh, similar experiences or who has a, a suggestion for what we can do. But uh, we're also happy I'm also happy to talk with anyone uh, who's interested in data extraction and our product more in general. So thank you very much. Yeah, I just want to announce who's next. So after Brian Maloney, we have uh, Nate about a symbol, app symbol. Uh, okay. 
Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Brian Maloney with Imaginary Landscape. Um, I'm also the current organizer of Chicago Jenga Knots uh, Users Group, um, which we reanimated about a year or so ago. Um, and we've had a number of meetings, and one of the couple of the members came up to me after um, after a couple of meetings that we should really have a website uh, for the group. And I thought it was a, a pretty good idea, so I went looking for domains in ChicagoJangonauts.org and the pithy chdj.org. And then I, on a coup, I just said, well, I looked at Jangonauts.org, and that was available. So I snatched it up and registered it, and I'm thinking, oh, God, what a great domain for Chicago Jangonauts. And then I was thinking that it might be a little presumptuous for us in Chicago to make use of uh, the Jangonauts domain. So we cooked up this idea <clears throat> of using it as a uh, central listing of all Django users groups. And so yesterday, ooh, okay, so hopefully it'll come up shortly. There it is. So yesterday we, uh, we launched this site very simple design, jangonauts.org has, uh, has a central listing of Django users groups. It's free. Um, you know, some groups have their own websites. You know, so a lot of them are on Meetup, um, and some don't have anything. So I just started pulling some sites together. Um, we're using Django CMS to cover it or to manage it which gives us some uh, nice flexibility. So if, uh, if you have a users group that doesn't have a web page, like the Chicago Django Nuts, <coughs> we can um, create a space in the uh, a section utilizing Django CMS for, uh, for just the group. So, uh, and we can, you know, so you log in and uh, just have the ability to edit through this section. So you can come on. Uh, and uh, and have a little corner of the uh, of the internet for your users group. Uh, if you don't like Meetup, or uh, for a while we were announcing meetings on, on Facebook, and we got a lot of pushback uh, on that. So uh, so it's like okay, cool. You know, we'll do it here. So it's free and open to anyone. If you have a users group, I encourage you to um, get listed. We have a uh, a nice form. Give the group name. Contact you know, latitude and longitude, so you can make a nice, you know, nice little icon on the map or website, uh, and we'll just link to it. And if you don't have a website, or would you like a little corner of that? Just say so. Uh, provide a uh, uh, suggested slug, and uh, I'll set up a user for you and give you a little corner for your users group. So, visit the site jangonauts.org, list your uh, list your group, um, and tell everyone about it. Thank you very much. All right, so next up is uh, Nate about AppAssembler. And then after Nate is uh, Ross about Django at CFPD. Okay. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Nate Ani, and um, I want to tell you about Assembler. Um, so, how many of you have ever wanted to try an open source project and just thought, well, I don't really want to spend a whole Sunday afternoon trying to figure out how to get that thing installed? Okay, a few people raising their hands. How many of you have ever made an open source project and thought, hey, maybe I can make some money off this and I could offer it as a hosted service, but then I have to deal with servers and billing and all that kind of stuff? So, AppSembler is a service that I started to solve this problem of, you know, all this great open source software, but it's really hard to to get started with it. And lots of um, you know people out there that are making it that, like Russell was saying, could maybe 
you know, finance their, their work by selling it as a hosted service. So we built this app store with just a handful of apps right now. Um, some of these you may recognize. And there's one called Richard. It's a video portal software. Um, and I'm going to show you how easy it is to, to try this out. So you just click on free trial, uh, type in the name that you want your site to be called, um, the domain name, and your email. And that's all you need to put in. Click launch my site and then you'll get an email message just checking, you know, asking you to activate your account. And immediately it starts firing up uh, a trial instance of this Django project. You can see it's deploying right now. And in a couple minutes, um, your site is now running. Click on that link and you can see your Django site is now running. There's no software to download, uh, nothing that you had to do on your side. Now, let me show you how it works for the developer. So if you're a developer, you can click on My Apps and you can register an app with AppSumbler. Uh, and you can connect your GitHub account, we pull down your code, or you can just paste in a uh, GitHub URL and just paste that in, uh, in that field there, click Register. And then what we're doing is we're checking out your code off of GitHub and you can choose what branch you want. In this case, it's just the master branch. And then we just ask a few questions, um, like what you want to call the app, what version you want. Um, and because we've checked out your code, we, we have a complete directory tree of all the files in your project, so we can quickly sort of auto-complete your settings file, your requirements file, choose what database you want. Uh, if you have any special app uh, Ubuntu packages that need to get installed, you can add those. Um, SyncDB, migrate, collect static, any commands that have to get run sort of post-deploy. Uh, uh, map your, your media files, your static assets, and then you click Create App. And what we've done now is we've created a recipe for how this app needs to be deployed. And right now it's in the private state. Once you publish it, um, you can add some marketing information. So you can, you can add things like a screenshot, a logo, some information about your project, a tagline. Uh, if you have a, a video screencast that shows people what your software can do, you can add that as well. And the idea here is that we want to make the software more accessible to people who are not technical. So non-technical people are not going to go to GitHub and <laughs> you know browse around to try to find software. They want sort of like a nice landing page that shows off your software. And that's what we've provided, uh, an easy way to get a free trial and, and start using the software. And the really cool thing is that we're going to share the revenue with the developers. So um, <coughs> you can set up a subscription plan. Right now there's just a trial plan. And you can go in here and you set the price. You decide, hey, I want to sell this, I want to sell a monthly subscription for $99 or $200 or whatever. Just go in here, add a subscription plan, and then we take care of all the billing on our site. We handle the credit card processing, and then at the end of the month, you get a check. And it's as simple as that. And you can see now there's a subscribe button that people can subscribe to the software. Um, so that's it. Um, if you're interested in just trying it out as a user, you can go to appsumbler.com click on the, uh, the apps tab at the top, or if you're a developer, um, just DM me on Twitter and I can set you up with a developer account. Right now it's in a beta, we're still testing, um, but we'll be opening that up very soon. Uh, we'd love to get feedback from people, and if anyone is interested in um, doing an open space, I'd also like to talk about building a, uh, a layer for pass, sort of like a, something that works with heroku.cloud, all of the different pass providers, and we'd love to plug that into our system so that we can deploy your app to any of those providers. Right now, we, we're running everything up on Amazon, but we'd love to, to make that more generic. So that's it. Thank you very much. So next we've got Ross, and then after Ross we have uh, Rob Terhar about works on my laptop. We've got Ross and slide one. Yep. Slide one. There it is. Downloads. Right there. That one. Oh. There we go. All right. Uh, my name is Ross. I work at CFPB. 
and this is just kind of a rapid fire overview of what we've been doing with Django in the past two years. Uh, we're the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. We were formed by Act of Congress in 2010, and we're the regulator of consumer financial products. Uh, Ask CFPB is a searchable knowledge base of uh, common financial questions and answers. Uh, it's backed by uh, Django Haystack. Uh, we publish the calendars of our director and deputy director, so people can see where they've been and who they've been talking to. Uh, we've open sourced the, the, um, the calculator and application tool for applying for federal transit benefits, and we've actually gotten interest from other agencies in using this, which is, you know, how this stuff is supposed to work. Uh, we also have a searchable database of almost every credit card agreement. Um, when I was handed this data set on a thumb drive, someone called it the most boring data set in the world. For a while, we were taking feedback on, proposed, on a proposed redesign of the mortgage disclosure forms, and people were able to click where they, what they felt was confusing. And this is, this is the end result of that data. Uh, this is a internal tool for launching EC2 instances. Uh, I called it Thing Launcher. And Django Nudge is an open source project that provides a push button content migration between servers. And our job site is also a Django app. You should check it out. Uh, one of our upcoming challenges is HUMDA, the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act. Uh, we're sitting on, and we will receive, data on every mortgage in America, and we're working on ways to make that more useful uh, so people can make sense of it, make sense of what's going on in their neighborhood, their town, and. Uh, and also download subsets of it for, uh, for offline research, and also want to build an API for it. And we also want to improve the process for uh, notice and comment on pending regulation uh, whenever we're about to propose a new law, we need to put it out there for people to comment on, and we think that can be done a lot better. And we're going to be working on an app to do that. And we want to make the regulations themselves easier to use for uh, consumers, the, the companies we regulate, and community groups. That's all I got. So now we have uh, Ross, oh sorry, Rob, about works on my laptop, is not good enough. Oh, and next up will be uh, Jacob Birch and Brian Veloso about DjangoCon's StarCraft tournament. Thank you. Okay, uh, this is a talk about operations and your Django app operating properly. So um, the thing I threw together quickly was works on my laptop is not good enough. I'm sure everyone has heard this before. Well, it works on my laptop. I don't know why it's not working on the server. But that's not really good enough. Um, because the reason that you write code is because your code is supposed to work on real servers. And you know, this is kind of an obvious thing. But sometimes it's not. Sometimes the fact that it is working on real servers is kind of like a serendipitous side effect, <laughs> more than like an actual intentional thing that you start from the beginning. So um, your dev environment and your production environment, they're probably kind of different. And you know that maybe that's an okay thing. Um, sometimes differences matter and sometimes they don't. And they tend to matter when they actually matter. Um, I'm sure you've all ran into some issues with uh, different Python versions different 
paths, things like that. Um, you know, maybe this stuff is kind of obvious, like, you know, your, your production environment should match your development environment. But the fact that it doesn't is maybe because you're not thinking about how your code matters for your business. And what is the actual reason? What is your goal as being a coder? Is your goal for being a coder to write code? Or is your goal for being a coder for your app to run in production and serve real customer needs? So I guess this talk is kind of about, about that. Focus on what, what the goals are for your code. Um, why is the reason you're writing code? So make your development environment equal, equal production. You know, keep your environments in sync. Use tools, uh, Puppet, Chef, you know, bash scripts, whatever you need to do to keep environments in sync. Use Vagrant, test your code on real environments, and focus on real goals for your code. Um, use a real deploy tool. Um, don't use git pull. Use Fabric, use a bash script, use something so you have a repeatable way to put your code into, into production. Um, use logging. This is actually something that's really important and this is maybe another obvious thing. Having really good logging in your application means that you can monitor things. You can log different components into different log files. You can send logs to different syslog servers. And this is the thing that really helps keeping your code operate in production. Because if it doesn't work in production, you don't really need to have a job, right? I mean, you're just writing code. So use syslog and focus on production. And that's it. Thank you. should be Jacob and Brian about StarCraft. And then after that is uh, David Ray about the Pi Carolinas 2012 conference. Brian, Jacob. Oh, okay, at the end. So that means David's up. And next will be Jason Krause. Oh, no, wait, you already did yours. Uh, Americ, then. Good morning, uh, my name is David Ray, I'm a developer at Cactus. I uh, want to talk uh, briefly about the five W's of Pi Carolinas, a new Python conference for the Southeast regional community. Uh, the five W's will be out of typical order. Uh, what is it? Well, it's the first, conference, first Python conference in the Carolinas. Uh, it's two days long, two tracks, two keynotes. They're still to be determined, I believe. 28 talks, um, lightning talks, sprints, oh, and it's free. Um, just registration, you'll have to pay to get there and house yourself and feed yourself occasionally, uh, but there are no registration costs. Uh, why, why not? Uh, but seriously, uh, to just promote some more regional community, there hasn't been a major um, regional Python conference in the Carolinas or the surrounding area for a while. Uh, when is it? Saturday and Sunday, October 20th and 21st. There is no football or basketball game at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill that weekend, so should be able to park somewhere close to the location. Um, it's at Kerr Hall at the UNC School of Pharmacy, which is an awesome venue. Um, I attended a training there myself a few years back, which the facilities are great. The wireless works really well, um, and the seats are comfortable. Um, who? Uh, PyCarolinas.org for more information. You can do at PyCarolinas to follow the Twitter feed. Questions at PyCarolinas.org if you want to email the organizer who happens to be Calvin Spielman, another developer at Cactus. Regrettably, he is pretty ill this week, so he was not able to attend. Uh, so I thought I'd provide this information for him. Uh, that's it. Thanks a lot. Got um, combinable settings from Americ Augustine, and after that will be Jason Novinger. I'm gonna get the settings off. Right. Usually go with a file when it comes out. Yeah. 
Okay, so for Enchanger, this is a technical talk. Um, first, a word of warning, uh, you shouldn't ever write large monolithic app, except yeah, that you usually learn that when it's too late, uh, and uh, so you have uh, to deal with this very common problem. So you have one code base, you have several sites, for example, you have your public website, your internal management thing, your help desk, et cetera. You have multiple environments, you have development, you have testing, you have a production, you have maybe performance testing, et cetera. You have different kind of settings, you have Django's own settings, you have your business settings, uh, you have your environment settings, and you have a lot of them. And which leads to this interesting problem, how do you obtain as easily as possible the settings for a given environment uh, uh, and, uh, well, set of things that you want to have. Uh, and you can have a lot of permutation of these. Uh, so I'm going to propose a solution uh, that makes it as simple as this. Uh, you have your settings module that is settings.preset.something. And once again, the taxonomy of something is purely up to you. Uh, so how do we achieve this? Uh, we're going to have this file architecture. As you can see, it's designed for fairly large projects. So here we have base, which contains stuff we always want, dev and prod, which are for the environments, and web services and web, uh, which are for uh, two different sites in this example. And we have the presets who combine them in a, it should be fairly intuitive. Um, and the preset, uh, you're going to have lots of presets, so we want to keep as short as possible, and we can bring in data to these three lines, uh, where it's obviously going uh, to merge a base, for example, uh, plus uh, uh, web, and here you can see you're doing something interesting. We're adding something to install the apps uh, because that's the way you really want to combine settings. You want to be able to alter things as you go adding stuff. Uh, you may want to add Sentry. You may want to add the debug toolbar uh, as, you, as you move through your different presets. So this would be dev, for example. Uh, and uh, to combine all this, uh, we just need a few lines of code that's going to uh, walk through uh, the, the corresponding presets and just exec file them. Uh, in a given environment, and maybe you remember on the first slide, I passed a global globals uh, as env, and so this means that it's going to execute each of my presets in this context and stuff everything in the global uh, in the global variables of the setting files, and I'm going to have a complete setting file in the end. Uh, there are a few interesting additional things we can do. Uh, we can define some default settings. So maybe you've seen this pattern. You have a, a available files somewhere and you simlink them from an enabled directory. Uh, for example, Apache uses that in Debian. Uh, and if you want to have this working with the file structure I showed at the beginning, you just need to add this in settings slash init. Uh, so it's going to call a load enabled function that's defined in utils. And uh, the load enabled function loads, looks like this. Uh, it's just uh, going to list uh, the files in your uh, available directory. And there's a typo on my slide. It should be, no, OK. It's, it's, uh, it's listing the file in enabled. It's uh, resolving the symlinks who should point to something in settings slash available slash uh, my, my best bricks. And it's going to load them in order. Uh, and another interesting thing we can do is that sometimes you want to add some local customizations. For example, you want to temporarily uh, disable the debug toolbar because it's too slow, or you want to point to an, another database. And you can just add these two lines uh, in the load settings uh, function, uh, which is going to execute whatever is in settings slash local slash something.py at the end, uh, and uh, apply that to your settings. So um, what are the advantages of this technique? Uh, it's fairly flexible. Also, it matches the mental model of the developer. You're just putting settings in a file and it's executed sequentially. Uh, yeah, unlike other approaches that are class-based, for example, like a Django configuration does, you don't need to learn anything new. And it's quite scalable. Uh, we have like 50 presets and 4,000 lines of settings, and it's still manageable. Uh, it has a very obvious drawback. It's that I'm using exec file. Uh, which is, has a kind of code smell uh, rather than import. Uh, I'm using this because I want to be able to combine and alter things I've defined before, uh, but it has the following drawbacks. Uh, Django's auto-reload doesn't work because it works via sys.modules, and here the, 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 the settings are never inserted in sys.modules. Uh, there's some implicit things going on. Uh, we're implicitly getting the variables from the things that were included previously in the chain, and there's no exec file on Python 3, uh, so if you want to do the same thing on Python 3, it's a bit more than fits in a slide. So thank you very much, and please use this responsibly as always.
so next is Jason Novinger, which is going to be in the browser. And after that is Preston Holmes about Colorland. All right, so my name's Jason Nominger. I work for the Daily Dot down in Austin, Texas. Uh, we're a media startup that is trying something a little bit different. Uh, so what we do is we report on internet communities rather than geographic communities. We, uh, we, we try to find the relevant topics, the interesting things on the net that people want to hear about, and we, we can uh, condense them and we aggregate them. We, we try to apply journalistic principles to that and, and do real reporting as opposed to just Here's a link to somewhere else. Here's you know something we reblog, and then the other thing we try to do is we try to to make it to where our, our readers can access Daily Dot uh, content anywhere, including the communities where they are. And so why do we do this? Is because you know the internet's made to connect people. Uh, social media is biggest online activity. We want to we want to be part of that. We want to share it with other people. I mean it's so easy for people in one community to see what's going on, but not to see across them. Uh, and then, of course, in regular media, you know, online communities are portrayed as kind of curiosities, and they're really not. They're real people out there doing real interesting things, and we want to talk about it. So who are we? We're a team of writers, uh, kind of true to our, our mission. We're not located in any particular place. Uh, headquarters are in Austin, but we have writers all over the country. Uh, reporting on places like Reddit and YouTube and Facebook and Kickstarter and Instagram. I mean, just any, any place where people congregate online talking about the interesting things they do. Uh, also, a small team of tech people. Uh, we use the same tools you guys do, Django and uh, Armstrong CMS. We, we run on AWS. We use Varnish and Apache and all that good stuff. Uh, we're a bunch of nerds, and we enjoy it. Uh, but why am I even here? Well, part of the reason is because Steve and the, the organizers of DjangoCon were really generous and gave us a press pass, which means I got to come for a you know, pretty nice reduced rate. And so we want to kind of reciprocate by providing great coverage about the community. Um, we want to tell people about the things you guys are doing with Django, and we want to tell them about how you're doing it. So in that vein, I kind of was hoping I could get you guys to help me out a little bit. And to go to our GitHub, I just started a, a public repo. If you guys want to fork that, drop in a little... Uh, markdown file or a rest file talking about what you guys do, what your product's about, what your site's about, how you use Django and related technologies. We're going to be putting together a piece on uh, how our favorite sites on the internet basically run and, and the technology they use. And if you think that your site really resonates with our, uh, our audience, then, you know, ping me. Reach out and, and give me a holler on Twitter and we can get together here sometime this week and, and see what we can't do. Uh, Probably talked to a couple of people about doing uh, particular pieces, so I'm really interested in doing that. So that's all I got. Thank you. Okay. And after Preston, we've got Stephen Burrows about Vid Scraper. Okay, so what I wanted to talk about was uh, I just basically created a little experiment demo to play with the idea of how can Django play in the sort of real-time space and still keep what is good about Django. So I created a, a little demo app where it keeps track of a bunch of people's different color choices. That's sort of the context. <clears throat> uh, real quick, I think we can all agree what real-time is. It's sort of this dynamic, um, responsive, feeling in the page where nothing reloads and everything changes uh, right in front of your eyes. And I would argue that Ajax really isn't real time because it's really sort of mostly one part of the direction, one, one part of the communication. Uh, so how can Django play along without 
abandoning it and going to something like Node entirely for the real time. There's no Python in the browser, et cetera. We're stuck with a couple of these constraints. Um, <clears throat> and what you find is that you often have this basic organization of your data. You have models that are bundled together with some condition that defines a collection. And uh, in the demo here, it's a set of color choices. It might be of a certain color or who's connected at a given time. And in Django, we have the idea of a query or query set defining a set of models. And in this case, in the demo, I'm using Backbone, and it's, it also has a notion of a collection with a set of model instances. And the question is, how can we sync these in a real-time way? Uh, you know, obviously, the AJAX side likes to say putting data from the browser to Django is relatively easy through AJAX, but how can you get, in a real-time sense, new models being created or models that now meet your condition that didn't, and that, that part is harder. So there's, there's a couple things I came up with. One is this uh, constant uh, idea called Django predicate, and what it is, it's a way of defining your collection with a query set-like set of quarks, and in fact, it is a subclass of the Q object in Django. So it lets you ask, take a model instance and ask the question, would this model instance be part of a query if I were to rerun the query? Because in a live sense, you don't want to be constantly rerunning a query against your database, but you want to be able to sort of take a model instance and ask, would this be part of it? Um, real quick, and then you can use this predicate to define the collection in Django. And the idea is that you hook this up to your post, save, and delete signal so that every time a model is saved, you can ask the question, does it match my predicate? Okay, well, this uh, is not blue. Blue is my definition that I'm looking for, so no. Is it currently a member? Yes, this was a member of the blue, so now I can emit a delete event to all the browsers that are interested in the blue objects. All right, overload time. Uh, this is a, a live working demo. We see, see if we can bring it down so you can go ahead and type this URL in, and I'm gonna race through this uh, really crazy slide. And, and what I tried to do is put together all these pieces that I've seen used in different combinations, but I don't think I've seen this particular combination all in one place. So the idea is when somebody saves their color choice, they have a socket I.O. connection via WebSocket to a G-Event socket I.O. It handles the model save, Django emits the model post-save signal, which is evaluated against a set of conditions, you know, predicates. In this case, it generates the update for that one model's channel, which anyone who's watching that model will get the update via their socket. Or if you're watching for just the orange or blue colors, it'll match that collection and emit a create and therefore add that instance. So here's the... Uh, some of the pieces, I've already published Django predicate as a standalone thing. It's, it's actually kind of handy because it can be used in uh, the filter call, so you can use it to generate query sets from your predicate, or you can use it just to test uh, arrays of actual model instances. Um, and I, I've really tried to sort of annotate this demo in a way that you can see how it, all the pieces fit together. And since I have a minute, let's pull it up and see if it's actually, if everyone's connecting. <laughs> Is it, is it totally uh, down? Oh, it's still there if you're in? Okay. Let's see if I even remember what it is. No. I don't even remember my own URL here. Well, I can just yield my time and you guys can play with it and I'll go back and reboot it if it needed. But, but uh, go check out the repo. I've tried, like I said, to annotate stuff and um, I know that there, I've already talked to several people about doing sort of a a, a real-time open space to see if, uh, if people want to do something like that. So. Nope, it's down. So uh, if anyone knows, I need to find somebody who knows, it's, it's basically the async part of Postgres failing. So it's, it's in the psycho green side of things. All right, so now we have Stephen Burroughs about VidScraper, and after that will be Chris Adams about Django's feed tracer. Hello, uh, I'm going to be talking about VidScraper. Uh, my name is Stephen Burroughs. You can find me on GitHub as Melanath and on Twitter as Python Burroughs. 
So what is VidScraper? VidScraper is a pure Python library. Uh, it helps you get video data from a variety of sources. So if you're using video and you're scraping it off the web, this is something that you should probably look into. It has an extensible programmatic API if you need to scrape some, some kind of video that we don't yet support, and it provides really standard access to video metadata. So if OMBED is not enough for you, you should look at this. It's everywhere. It's on GitHub, read the docs, PyPy, Travis, and IRC. It's not a cat video. It is a generic, it is not a generic feed or website parser, and it's not a Django package. So this is Python, not Django. Of course, Django is Python, but if you want the Django version of storing these models, uh, you can look at Miro Community. VidScraper has built-in support for Blip, Vimeo, YouTube, Ustream, crusty ancient things that you find lying around the internet, and a couple other things too. This is the basic way to use it. You import the autoscrape function, you put in a URL for a video, uh, and it comes back with all sorts of useful metadata. So, title, user, some other things. But what if you only want, say, the title, you don't want the user? Well, then you just put in the uh, fields that you want from the video, and the other fields just don't get loaded. And what this means is that VidScraper is extremely lazy. It loads the maximum number of fields based on what you ask using the minimum number of requests that it can. That's HTTP requests. Uh, it has a bunch of fields for common metadata. You have title, description, GUID, um, user, user URL, and a couple others. You can also scrape uh, feeds really easily from the internet. Again, you import the auto feed function and you put in a URL and that gives you a generator which lets you iterate over the um, videos in the feed. So here we have a JingoCon feed and the first video in it is A Summer in the Wild. So since this is a lightning talk, I don't want to go into all of the details, but uh, a couple of, a quick overview of some of the features that I didn't get to talk about. The feeds are very lazy. They load each page as you get to it, and um, they, so you load the page, crawl through it, get to the next page, load that page, crawl through it, and you can specify a maximum number of results if you don't want to go on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Uh, there's no global state. Every time that you make a call, you pass in the API keys, so that makes it really easy to use with Django if you want to, or to use uh, in any other way that you might need it. It also has support for video searches on services that support that. So no questions, obviously, because uh, this is a lightning talk, but if you want to find me, Stephen Burroughs, Melanath on GitHub, Python Burroughs, find me. Last today, I'm assuming we have uh, Chris Adams about Django Speed Tracer. So this is going to be a, a very, very quick talk. Uh, you might be familiar with the Google Chrome debugging tools. One of the really nice things that they've added over the years have been great views and where the browser spending time. Chrome also has this extension called Speed Tracer, which gives you even more insight into exactly why the browser is doing something. You know what specifically caused the CSS reflow? Why did JavaScript just do a garbage collection? One of the really neat things they have is a protocol for doing the um, for actually doing server backtraces. So when you're looking at a complex AJAX application, you can see this JavaScript loaded resources from this URL. This caused all of these activities on your server, which resulted in us getting a response back a little later. 
there you can start seeing this with multiple requests. If you start having a complex app, it's not the Django debug toolbar style page load and then anything that happens in the background, you have to collect some other means. There, you know, th this is a really nice technique. So I have a, apparently not a working back key, but um, anyway, I've put together a little uh, mi middleware class for Django which provides the information in the format Speed Tracer wants. There's actually one big problem that I like some ideas if anyone has, and that's how to collect efficient call trees in Python, not the C profile style where the functions were taking the most time were, but actual detailed trace levels, and then start getting some ideas from other people what level of collapsing this is useful. Most of us don't care about things getting down into the Django ORM, but knowing where in your views we started those calls is really useful. So if you have any ideas, this is at all interesting to you. It's Django Speed Trace. It's on GitHub. I'm easy to find. Let me know. Quick, you don't need to applaud. I'm just announcing something. Um, So we've been talking about this. If you like StarCraft and you are here, this is today, not tomorrow, as that says. But it is the 5th. It is at 7. It's at uh, the conference theater, which is just its kind of left kind of back. Uh, we You don't need to be good. Uh, you don't need to be great. Um, you just need to like StarCraft. We we'll probably be playing for four or five hours. We will be playing some form of organized play. There will be a winner at the end. Brian Veloso will be streaming it. There will be prizes. There will not be food. Bring your own food. And that's it. If you need to have any questions, if you're excited, if you're nervous, not sure if you want to come, talk to me, talk to Brian. That's it.